to introduce John Midwood to talk about managing cereal cultivars in the high rainfall zone. John has spent the past 28 years in ag, um, 13 of which uh, working for a large UK farm management company. And then in 04 came over here, uh, did agronomy, managed grain search, and operated his own consulting business for a while, including putting in commercial trials and con under contract for SFS. And since 2010, he has been the CEO of this organisation. John initially brought a, always has brought a passion towards farming. He's one of the few people that's been able to get over the divide between how high yields are where he came from and sometimes how tough to get those sort of yields are in this environment. I like to think that some of us spent a couple of years trying to say to him, yeah, that's great, but it might rain next week. And I think he's got that message in the last few years. So thank you, John, for your <laughs> OK, so um, you'll, uh, you'll enjoy the first couple of slides, because that's touching on the weather straight away. So um, I'm actually only going to talk about um, wheat. Uh, I looked at the time that I got, and um, I really can't, I couldn't do barley justice putting it all in as well. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is based on the paper that's um, in the results book. Um, I'll just try and put a bit of uh, flesh on the bones if you like, and a bit of context around it. So, the first thing, uh, and, and I guess if, uh, and it's interesting, sitting on the Southern panel, uh, we, we hear many, many ideas that come through the door, but if somebody could nail what the weather's going to do, and forecasting, uh, we did, well I wouldn't be stood here now if I knew how to do it. Um, so. <laughs> So it's, it's just such a massive part of the decision making process and, and, it, and it ties in really nicely with them, uh, what I'm about to talk about because your decision on what variety you grow and how you grow it and how hard to push it is completely down to risk management for the season that's going to be thrown your way. You don't really know what's going to come your way. Forecasting's getting better but it's still got a long way to go. So, 2018. Uh, you'll all remember this uh, with deep joy, uh, other than the prices were really good. Um, pretty dry summer, uh, the autumn was looking pretty dry and we're all scratching around going, I wonder how we're going to get these crops in and, and how they're going to grow. And then we got a really good rainfall in May and, uh, and we were away. The winter was sort of average. We actually probably needed to, to have a dry month coming out of the winter. Well, it turned into a really horrible uh, September and October. Um, the only slight glimmer was that at the end of November uh, we, we got some reasonable rainfall and, um, and as you'll see uh, some of the varieties that we've got actually uh, made use of that. So uh, I'm sure you've seen these before, um, the, the, um, the black dots here is Inverley, Bowlake and Hamilton um, are our sites. This is sort of as close to the growing season as I could get but um, you know showing that from the 1st of May to the 31st of October, uh, we, were, we were looking pretty sad, I have to say, um, at our site at Bairnsdale, um, our colleagues down there have really struggled massively. But sometimes it's not all about just uh, growing season rainfall and the deciles, it's more about when it falls. And I guess the, the big thing that's really impacted on crop yields this year uh, was, was this, was that the rainfall deciles from September through to the end of November. So even with reasonable finish to the season, uh, all our sites sat in a uh, very, very low decile situation, which had a massive impact on uh, yields at the end of the day. Some of the sites also suffered from bits and pieces of frost. So, uh, so that sort of sets the context. Uh, so what I'm going to just talk about now is, is our wheat variety management trials that we did this year. Just to sort of remind you, uh, we, um, in 2017, we, uh, we've obviously been running for three or four years now, the MBT, and the MBT is a straight horse race based on sowing date, a full program of nitrogen and fungicide, just to, to try and minimise any impacts of nutrition and, and, um, and disease, and just uh, based on that sowing date and the environment, how those varieties are going to do. So we said, okay, can we do something different? Can we do some variety trials where 
we can actually target a spe specific yield and can we actually uh, tailor that and put inputs on based around the yields and, and, um, uh, and can we pick varieties that are pretty relevant to our area. So that's where we started with the variety management trials and, and we've, we've come uh, through them now into the second year. We, we are going to change them, we're proposing to change them for this coming year because uh, I'll allude to as I go on a bit, there are issues with uh, what you'll see because it's very difficult to tease out exactly what's caused the, the, the yield gains that we've had. So, so um, this is there's quite a lot going on in this slide, but I just thought it was a really good slide to. Um, I think you put this together, didn't you, James? This is um, one that just sort of puts the whole lot into picture. So here, here are the four, the three sites. Uh, the previous cropping, probably important things to notice, which had a pretty overriding influence on uh, some of the yields. Uh, and and what went on was that we had massively high levels of nitrogen um, at these two sites. Uh, not so much coming out of field peas at the Inverley site. We had two times of sowing, uh, 18th of April um, at Inverley, 7th of May, and then the, the other site sort of matched when we could get onto them, uh, 13th of April, 8th of May at Bradvale, and 23rd of April and 9th of May at Morgiana um, at Hamilton. And then within those, um, within those time windows, uh, we were able, either able to do what we called full uh, full program, which is basically targeting uh, nine tonne a hectare, so we do deep ends um, and, uh, and work out what nitrogen we think we need to put out. Uh, we put a bit of extra, P we put PGR out, um, uh, extra N or appropriate N, and another fungicide, and that's more or less what we're trying to do. So just ramping it up a little bit um, versus what we call economy, which is probably uh, well, it's more of a basic approach and it's aimed for trial yields of about 7 tonne a hectare. Um, so, where, where I've written down full and economy, that's actually uh, a trial design that we're able to use uh, called a factorial. So, we're actually able to run the two together in a trial and actually it's an ability to tease out whether the, the management uh, has had an influence, whether well, there's an interaction between the management and the variety. Um, and uh, in most cases, it wasn't. Uh, but nonetheless, the trial allows you to do that. Um, so the, the boxes where I've just put full on economy, they were just standalone trials on their own with that um, management strategy involved. So sometimes when you're, um, when you're making decisions on the farm, you need to um, make sure uh, how that decision is going to be and whether, whether the decision you make is... Um, I wonder if I can get this to go. Well, this, here we go. Um, Yes, so whether the decision you make is going to work, and sometimes just a really small error in your decision making can have a catastrophic <coughs> effect uh, on how you grow your crop of wheat. Managed above and, and 0.5 a ton. So, all really good, and um, 
So, so what does that mean? What, what are the lessons that we can learn? Well, um, the lessons that we learned are that actually there was no interaction between management and the varieties at all. So, so what we can do is we can say that the management strategy across all the varieties overall gave a statistical yield advantage. Uh, and when we look at the varieties, the varieties, when you put the two management strategies over each other, were there were statistical differences, but actually what was one... So if you were growing uh, plenty and, uh, and you put full management versus um, economy on that, you, there was actually no statistical difference. So, but nonetheless, it, it, the ability of this trial layout is, uh, enables us to, to, to see some interesting stuff. And I guess, for me, uh, it's, um, it's really nice to see an old faithful uh, variety uh, in revenue, which um, probably still uh, has some reasonable following in the, in the Western District. In Tassie, uh, really, Septoria has, has really seen the end of it. Um, but interesting that over here now, um, you know, revenue's got some uh, pretty stiff competition coming from I guess Manning was its replacement, slightly longer variety, but then now we, we have varieties like Akrok uh, in the system and Calabro. Uh, but, but in this trial, with the, with the varieties that we have in here, um, that, that um, finished at the end of the season, so low disease, so revenue really didn't come under too much pressure uh, from disease, and, and um, at both sites um, gave a, a significant yield advantage. Uh, there was a suite of varieties that followed it over here. The, the only variety um, in the, at the Breadvale site that wasn't statistically different was uh, Manning and then, um, and then Akrok and then it dropped away with, with some of the other varieties. So no, no uh, significant interaction between management and variety but on their own, yes a difference between the management strategy across all varieties and, um, and varietal difference when you put the two managements together. So, um, I probably should change and turn me off afterwards for doing this, because probably from a stats point of view you shouldn't really do this, but I have, I have got a disclaimer to say that it's... So, these are the yields uh, that are, I just really wanted to show that where we're seeing that yield increase from that full management strategy, where, where are we seeing that? Uh, so, so, it's pretty varied across the varieties, but as I said, uh, Statistically, there are no stats on this slide because um, I cut, there's no significance, but it, it is interesting just to see, nonetheless, that um, some of the varieties, you know, like new varieties like Acrop, um, quite a big yield lift, pretty small lift on revenue given um, the disease susceptibility of the variety. Uh, so, uh, gross margins, that's, it, that's the other thing that we're doing in these variety trials um, compared to MVT, we're actually putting some gross margins against them. And um, so uh, the green bars are, the, are your economy and, uh, and the red bars are your full. Uh, <coughs> most of the grain didn't make anything better than feed quality, um, mainly because of um, specific weights, and we think that's probably <coughs> down to um, the, the, um, the season and that very dry spring. Um, but uh, yields king, as it always is in this situation, and. Um, you, you have a situation there where you've got over $2,000 a hectare uh, gross margin based on the figures that are in the book uh, of the varieties. And I guess, you know, if you looked at the average, it probably falls away a fair bit. And we'll look at May sowing in a minute, and you'll see that the top end of the May is not as far out as, as the revenue, but the drop off is probably slightly smaller. So the key messages for me that I took out of that um, is that. Uh, the choice of variety is key to getting your yields right. Um, and in this season, that, those longer season winter cereals uh, made use of that late spring rain. But as I said right at the start, when we're looking at climate, we don't know, you know, sat here today, you know, uh, dry as it is, you know, the, the window of opportunity, unless we get a whole heap of rain or we're going to take the chance and dry so with a winter uh, wheat variety now, it's getting pretty risky and you just don't know what you're going to get at the end of the season. So it's all about risk management and probably what varieties you've got, but last year um, the old faithfuls of the winter weeds came through. Um, so revenue highest yielding at 8.5 tonne, it was also the highest yielding at Bradvale, as I said before, with Manning pretty close behind and, and, um, and, uh, 
and then Akrot just in behind that. Uh, so the full management strategy did increase the yield of all the varieties from uh, 6.4 to 7 and, um, and by 0.3 at Bradvale. And uh, the full management treatments yield more than the economy consistently across all the varieties, but it actually didn't always, as you can see from before, didn't always give a, um, an effect on gross margin. So now I just want to look at the May site. So we actually had a, uh, a, um, an April sown site at, at uh, Morgiana, but um, I, I think the data was more interesting uh, from the May sowing from Morgiana. So um, I have it's in the, paper, the details are in your report, but this is this is the May sowing, which was 9th of May. Uh, a non-statistical non significant difference between uh, economy and full, uh, but we did see differences in, in uh, protein, but that's probably not to be, no, no surprise when uh, the site was already pretty high uh, with, with N, and then we were topping that up to try and uh, maximise yield. So, uh, Less varieties around in the trial um, and the response by variety across both those management strategies um, are showing that um, Trojan, which is sort of widely grown, um, is still right up there. Beckham's pretty, pretty handy and Illabo, which is um, a, a newer variety from AGT, um, which, which has some uh, winter habit in it, um, has, um, has uh, come top at that side. Uh, if, we, if we then look at the May sowing from, uh, from the Inverley, so, so these are all individual trials, there's no, there's no, um, uh, um, these aren't a, a, a factor in them, so uh, they're just, they just stand alone. Uh, so <coughs> interesting here how we have some of our, our old faithfuls, um, you know, good old Beaufort still up there, and I'll show you a bit of data in a minute on, from MBT over a number of years, and it, it probably, illustrates really nicely why both is still, still such a good variety. Um, Beckham, Beckham ha having a pretty good place with um, Bennett, Diaz Bennett, which is new, has been a bit sort of um, underrepresented uh, here in the trials, but this is sort of down to whether the breeders all, um, are happy for us to put the variety in and, and um, uh, you know, Trojan still well up there. So uh, again, looking at the gross margin, so a lot of, the, a lot of this may sown, um, work was done just uh, looking for a lower yield because basically if you're sowing a little bit later, um, yield potential is lower, so there's no point kidding yourself that you can get a high yield by sowing late. We, we all know that lesson. Um, and so what I was saying earlier on was um, you haven't got these figures up here like we had with the revenue, but it's probably a tighter band uh, in terms of gross margin. And, and interesting that um, and this is two years in a row that this has happened, and I know it comes back to the weather again, the weather forecast and, and knowing what's going to happen before you sow, but actually it isn't always a disaster if you sow the appropriate variety in May. We can still, you can cut your costs, you have a quality variety, and you pick the right variety, you can still get a reasonable result. Uh, and here, here was the uh, April sown, just to remind you again of that bigger spread. <coughs> so key messages uh, from that May sowing, um, that um, Trojan and, and Beaufort at uh, Inverley and Bradvale uh, were the highest yielding uh, in the full management um, at around 8 tonne from May sowing. Uh, Beckham was pretty close behind and we saw that last year. Um, so uh, the May sowing trial in Morgiana had both management treatments but um, there was no interaction between variety management and uh, in contrast to some of the other trials, the management, the full management actually did increase the yield. Um, and uh, Illabo and Trojan were the highest yielding varieties of about um, seven and a half tonne. And in 2018, high gross margins didn't necessarily come from higher input costs, so management uh, uh, high versus economy, or more importantly, sowing earlier. So as I said before, um, sowing date is key, but, but variety choice and management um, is also key. So, um, so just to just to look at um, MBT because um, the MBT website is a is a challenge. It, it is improving, and and um, if you've got the patience to go and sit and 
dig through it. There's actually some pretty interesting stuff on there. So, um, so I looked at, at uh, the variety, the results from the MBT varieties in the southwest. So three sites, Hamilton, Streatham, and, and Inverley, for the last three seasons, and uh, and then looked at uh, all the varieties, the sort of current varieties we're growing, um, and how they went in what, what they call the early season trials. And so these are these are trials that, if you average the sowing dates about the third week in in April over the years, and uh, versus the the other MBT uh, stuff, which I'm not showing, which is the slightly later zone, which would be sort of into early to mid-May. So from that early sowing, those early sowing trials, I, I pulled out these varieties that are along the bottom here and um, mapped their yield. So, so on this axis here, you've basically got 100% um, uh, is basically in that year the average of that site and then anything that's above that is basically you know, above the mean of the site. So if you remember back to the data that James showed you earlier on, 2016 as we all remember was an absolute fantastic year, plenty of moisture, not too much water logging and a nice cool finish and we all got, you know, we had trial yields that year of um, 10 and a half, 11 tonnes, which is fantastic. 2017 was a shocker, um, re really dry and, and, and clearly throughout this area, uh, big issues with frost. Uh, and this year uh, was looking fantastic, but we ended up with a shocking spring and um, a little bit of frost, but, but right at the very end, we ended up with that later rainfall, which uh, helped some of the, the longer season varieties. So I basically went through the list and cut out all the short season varieties, the currently grown short season varieties that are grown, um, and most of them I might add are spring types. Uh, majority of this have, these, these varieties have some winter vernalisation requirement in them. Uh, so I split those out and then I'll show you the next graph where I'll come back to those shorter ones. So what this is showing you is, is, um, is, is that, that yield again. So, so there's, your, there's, your, um, there's your mean for, for the site. So 2016, fantastic year. What happened to these long season varieties? Absolute went gangbusters and absolutely fantastic yields. And, and you know, hit, hit, a, hit a whole heap of records. 2017, shocking year, absolutely hopeless in terms of uh, providing anything useful from a long season variety. Some, some did better than others, and, and they're probably the ones to, to keep in mind. And I have put Beaufort in there. Uh, I might have had a bit to do with Beaufort, so, um, um, so but, but I think um, Beaufort actually appears in the next set of data because it's probably the only variety that we've got that um, can actually sit in both charts and still has a place. So uh, some varieties did okay, some didn't do very well at all, and there's no great surprises. Uh, that's actually revenue in Manning, so way too long for the, for the season, um, but you come to this year where we ended up with that um, late finish and what's happened, you know, some of the yields picked up, particularly um, particularly revenue, prob probably Manning's um, just a touch too long, but, you know, interestingly that um, you've got varieties here like Agrop, which is, um, you know, everybody's talking about, um, that, that struggled a little bit um, in this season. So that's the, that's the early season MVT for the South West for the last three years for those long season varieties and then exactly the same set of data for these varieties, so, so both are back in, but now Trojan, which you'd all be growing, uh, Beckham, Illibo, Illibo is an interesting one because Illibo actually has some uh, winter habit to it, but as does Longsword, uh, but I've actually put, because of the way their, the graph looks, I've actually um, put them into here. So, so look, at the shape of the, look at the shape of those years. So 2016, really good year, they did okay. But look at both of absolutely, you know, was killing it. And then yeah, it was 2017, short season, dry finish. But actually, they're all bunched up together there. But that's good because that gives you a suite of varieties to play with. And then we get to this, to this year, and they just haven't got that kick back on the tail uh, like those longer season ones. And again, we don't know that until you put it in the ground and the season finished. But nonetheless, I just thought that was um, of interest. So, 
Um, that's what I'm going to say about the, the, uh, the week. Um, just to finish off, um, I gave a talk at the GRDC update at Bendigo, and I just really, uh, I've just pulled a couple of slides out of this to, um, to pass on to you guys, because it, it was a presentation about uh, the yield gap and filling the yield gap uh, in the high rainfall zone uh, and what we can do about it. So, but we need to start somewhere. So when people say to you, what is the yield gap? There's, there are models like APSIM and Yield Profit that'll give you theoretical yield gaps. Uh, and then there's what's actually reali the reality of what's happening in the paddock. So um, I, don't want to, I don't want to stand here and talk to you about model, models and APSIM and stuff, because um, you know, I was an agro and I know talking to my clients, they, they go, you know, what do models know? So, um, so what, what I'm saying to you is, well, let's, let's use the best yields that we physically produce in our trials, and yes, they're trial yields, and that means there's no wheeling, damage, and headlands, da 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 but nonetheless, they're real yields that we produce at our site. And let, let that be a benchmark that we're going to aim for, and see where we are today, and see if we can fill that gap. So, so in the southwest, water limited yield, because we don't have irrigation, the current situation is, uh, it's estimated that um, our yields, we're only producing about 41%, 47% of water limited yield potential, uh, which is pretty shocking. That's, that's pretty low. And, you know, probably, hopefully you guys that are here, majority of you are here because you're at the top end of the, uh, of, um, the growers that we deal with. And the reason you're here is because you want to hear all this stuff to just be able to tweak it a little bit more. Uh, so you're probably not that low in comparison to water yield water limited yield potential, but nonetheless, it's an interesting starting point to think about what you're doing. And so in good seasons like 2013 and 2016, uh, we produce yields in excess of uh, 10 and a half, 10 and, 10 and a half ton a hectare uh, in dry land trials, both at Westmere and at uh, Inverlee, and that was both in wheat and barley. Uh, and <coughs> even in years that have been really tough, so 2017, which was a, a, a decile 4, um, 2018, pretty similar. We produced trial yields of 8 ton a hectare from dry, dry land trials. So to me, they should be, yes, they're trial yields, but they should be, they're real, they're real life yields that have been achieved. So they should be what people should be aiming for in the respective years. So one of the things that came out of the whole heap of work that was done, that as part of this management strategy for what you decide you want to do uh, to optimise yield and hence gross margin is that you should never take one of the factors that I'm going to leave as a big one, I'm going to leave you with a list of levers that you could be pulling to optimise yield and, and gross margin. But the important message is, is that you don't just pull one, one, lever, one or two levers like, for example, variety or sowing date will have big influences, but there's a lot of small stuff that sits behind that that in itself are not big changes, but, um, but cumulatively they have a significant effect. And this is just a little interesting video that shows this is from Thailand, and these guys are pile driving, and this just shows you that on their own, they'd never be able to achieve this, but you start putting lots of little things together, cumulative effect, um, and you start to um, see the influence. Unfortunately, there's no sound, but there's a guy, you see the guy down at the bottom here with the... Yeah, and this guy gets on here now and he gets a bit of beat going. And once he gets going, you know, so the cumulative effect of all these guys... <laughs> that's technology at its best. <laughs> there you go. So, just to finish off, last slide. So, what, what were those? What were those key management drivers that you need to close that yield gap? So, so these are actually in order of importance um, from from some different survey work that was done on farms. Um, there's, there's probably three research projects that have come up with this information, and interestingly enough. Um, not rate of nitrogen is still the most significant by about four or five times is still one of the most significant influences on driving and closing that yield gap so there's still way too many people 
are making the wrong call in the amount of nitrogen they're putting on. But we've already seen why that is potentially, and that's because we've got the seasons that we don't know what are going to throw at you. The second one, um, crop rotation <coughs> can't be overemphasized. In fact, Vern was talking to me at morning tea and saying on the crop competition that we've got, it, at the moment it just looks on how, how are crops performed on one year. But actually, what we're all about and the people that are really growing crops well are, are actually looking at that whole rotation. And for, for you two guys that won, how good potentially are the crops going to be that you've got in the paddocks next year, the year after that, and the year after that. So crop rotation is really important and, and um, there's some data that um, Nick Paul talked about where he was basically saying there's a, that there's a bag nitrogen limit um, that you can, get, you can go out and put on a crop. You can't just go and dial up a yield and go, you know, I'm in Tassie, I've got water, I've got good soils, I can get 14 tonne a hectare, I'm just going to pile a load of nitrogen on to do it. You will not do it putting bag nitrogen on. You need to have uh, natural fertility in the soil that comes out of your crop rotation fundamentally. Variety choice we've already looked at and sowing date. Um, Rowan talked about all those things to do with canola earlier on. It's absolutely no different when it comes to uh, what we do with wheat and what, what we do with barley. Um, uh, and the, these other ones become a little bit more subjective. It's nice to see there's plenty of agros in here, so um, all that agronomic input is, um, is really important. And you can't overemphasize the company. Farm management company I work for in the UK, I reckon when I started working for them, I went to work for them because <coughs> I believed that technically they were the best company for me to go to work for to learn the skills of how to manage a crop. But actually, as time went by, um, a lot of the good growers caught up to where our technology was because there's only so much you can get ahead of the game um, by you know, talking to the chemical companies and, and that <coughs> became a lot more available. But what they did do, and I reckon what sets a lot of, of the really good growers apart from the rest, is timeliness and implementation of a decision to go and do something. And then when you do it, doing it with um, good attention to detail. Thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> Just please, a couple of quick questions in here if you've got them. Yes, there's a question. John, just a comment. It's, it's like sometimes it's easy to stand at the, at the end of the season and say, we should have put more nitrogen now, but the outcome doesn't always, uh, isn't always a direct relation to what the quality of the decision is. So yeah. It'd be great to see some farming systems polling your members throughout the year and to get a gauge on their confidence because the nitrogen um, application at that time might actually be a great decision but then there's late rains and, and we're not achieving that yield yeah. but or conversely the decision making might be off because like I said there's that nervousness but if there's a bit of a you know, if you can go to that through the decision making and the confidence levels, it might be great to look back on and say, well, realistically, if the confidence was down and there was no need to be, or the confidence was up but it shouldn't have been. And so I don't know if you've got a comment on that, but... Um, um, yeah, I mean, the other, the other thing that goes in, in hand with that is that I would really like companies like Instate Pivot, who do a, a, a lot, but they do a lot of uh, soil testing, deep end testing in the Western District. Why, when they get to a certain number of, of those results, don't they put out a newsletter saying, here in these areas are average soil test results um, for deep end? Now, I know that's not going to be specific to your paddock, but clearly background levels of end, you know, what does that, what does that look like after you, like we came out of those frosts in 2017, and one of the things that we found out, which nobody really knew about, was suddenly we had very high levels of N left in the paddock after frosted crops. But how good would it have been to have had that more widely known by people? And I, it really annoys me that companies like that, that we all pay money into, hold all that information back and then we don't have it. So, I, you know, I, 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 I agree with you. I'd, I'd, like, yeah, I, I'd like to think I could help you with the other nitrogen, but that's a... Well, in fact, we've got Mike talking in a minute, and it's a good segue into him coming up, because um, he knows way more about it than me, and he'll probably tell you a similar story, but, um, but anyway. 
And the other thing is, of course, that's the basis for the probe network as well, to give us some, you know, some at least area-based data on what is there prior to those big nitrogen decisions. So, quickly, and did I say yeah? Too quickly. Go, you go first. I just want to ask on the probes, have you seen or trialled those probes that are supposed to be able to give live um, nitrogen, pH, and potassium levels in the soil? No. No. It's Brett here, because he's going to have to make sure, yeah. So Brett, Brett's um, going to, who works for us, is, gonna, is taking over the probe network, and yeah. we're just about to sort of revamp it all, so um, I'll pass that on. Yeah. And one over here. Uh, I mean, it's just what, I know, what's your gut feel, like if you pull all your, your management full of funding out, the benefit of the PGR in the week? Yeah, good questions, because what, what, what I didn't say is what we were proposing to do for this coming season. So what we're, what we're looking to do, because if you turn to me, as somebody did at um, Bendigo last year and said, okay, that's really interesting, but why did, why, so if you remember last year, Trojan and both, I think, uh, yielded better and gave us a better gross margin. And I was asked the question, why has that happened? And I don't know. I, I know. I know they got a bit more N, they got a bit, another fungicide, and they got a PGR, but did any of those actually impact was, was any one of those significant or was a group of them so what we're actually proposing to do this year is to take single varieties sow them specifically and they, they might be different varieties sown next to each other but they'll be sown specifically to their sowing date and then they'll have the inputs put into them <coughs> at the appropriate exactly the appropriate time for those varieties and you can never do that on a big trial because you're always compromising on yield and then and then the, the other difference is, is dropping out PGR but doing the other, but doing say fungicide and nitrogen and then include PGR but drop out fungicide. So we're going to do an emission trial basis just on individual varieties. So I'll be able to answer that question. If you come back to me next year, I wish you will, won't you? Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll be able to answer that question because the, I can't at the moment. It, um, so, so all I can say is from a PGR point of view, yes they're put out there to keep the crop standing, but so much of the data we saw in the UK, if they're applied at the right time, is that you get a yield advantage in the absence of logic. I can't prove it at the moment though, because everything gets thrown in together and you can't tease it out. Do you reckon that's our spot related in the UK? Uh, might be. <laughs> Thank you very much, I'm going to stop you there. <laughs> Private conversation. Thank you very much, John. Thank you.